Well, you got that nexus certainly there at yes. Fordham, and and you took that further at American University, you know, with your international relations PhD. Tell us about what your field of study was, why you chose that, and how you thought that could apply back home. Okay, the in my PhD was a little bit similar. <laughs> I was actually applying for PhDs in economics, but sure. I, again, in this case, I couldn't find something that would, would get funded. But the good thing was when I was in American University. What I specialized in was development management. So then I was exposed to all of these different models. Uh, this was the height of BRAC, the height of Grameen. This was the height of the Latin American uh, uh, the spring, when they were all coming out of dictatorships and all trying to think of development models. We would be able to look at the world development model. So I'm sorry, the World Bank model. So this was, uh, this was a time when I was actually able to look at different ways being applied all over the world to help people out of poverty. And, uh, and so it was, I learned so much and I think it was, so my two fields were development management and international development. So one gave me, one gave me a look at the grassroots from, from agricultural development uh, to rural development and the other gave me a policy perspective, what the World Bank was doing, what the IMF was doing, what the IFC was doing. So it's a great mix and uh, it really provided the context I needed. What is your mindset in terms of how do I put this all together to go back home to the Philippines and think about, okay, what is the proper hybrid here for a country like the Philippines, which is going through its, all this tumult as well? Well, I think, I think that, that's, 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 a, that's a good way to put it. It needs to be a hybrid. It has to be born out of the experiences of the people on the ground. You cannot do policy without understanding what's happening on the ground, what's, what's really going on in people's lives, in people's schools, in their homes, at their jobs. But neither can you stay there at that level because many of the problems are national, policy, institutional in nature. So you have to be able to find that, that junction of being able to work for people but being able to create policies that affect as many as possible. And so it's, it's, it's precisely that hybrid which is important. Well, listen, I mean, this was a very productive time for you, and then some. You actually were raising a family at that time. Tell us about the balance. Well, uh, it was tough. <laughs> it was tough. I had to, I had to, uh, I was doing more than 40 hours of, sure. besides my studies, I had to, at one point in time, I was working more than 40 hours a week to support my family. Uh, I was, and I was doing odd jobs. I was, I was a, I was a billings clerk. Then doing some research work on the side. Uh, it was tough, but I think the, the good thing was at least for, for a starting family. You know, we started in the States. So we started without the trappings of, 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 of family life here. We didn't have house help. We didn't have people to take care you of You had to do kids. errands all yourself. We had to yeah. do errands. I, I, I can boast of the fact that I changed the diapers okay. of my kids. I was in the, in the room when both my daughters were born. So those experiences, I don't think I would have ever gone through. It's tough, and I think it helps you. It helps prepare you for the future. Meaning, after we went through that period, I, I came. I came home with debt. We really had to watch our budget regularly. You know, uh, we wouldn't be able to enjoy. We didn't travel a lot. It's a great crucible for learning. And then the disruption happens. You come back home. How you ended up full circle back to AIM? I was writing my dissertation. I could not afford anymore because at that point your fellowship runs out. I couldn't afford to support a family and myself in the U.S. while writing the dissertation. So I had no choice but to come home. And uh, AIM then was an opportunity because my family roots were connected to AIM. So I was able to enter the door in AIM. And uh, that, that's how I ended, ended up back there. It was a great environment because I was in an academic environment. Uh, that allowed me to write my dissertation and finish my dissertation. I think that's, that's actually not, that doesn't happen often, that you can actually work and finish your dissertation at the same time. So it gave me that privilege. Well, you had that wonderful work ethic, the transition back home, but also the fact that AIM Policy Center was at the front lines and had a platform for looking at those structural reforms at that yes. time under the Ramos administration, where we had these unprecedented raft of reforms. Yes. Tell us about what kind of a role you carved out for the center in terms of being the honest broker or think tank for really a lot of these administration's reforms. Yes, because we, at that point in time, there was no uh, high visible, highly visible academic think tank at that point. The most visible think tank at that point in time was Makati Business Club, which tends to be identified with, with, with the private the sector community. business yeah. community. And so we were able to provide that honest broker picture. And I think our, our main contribution at that point in time was to bring into the discussion uh, the discourse was the co word competitiveness. I think we were the ones who really introduced competitiveness and the importance of seeing the country in light of how it's doing versus uh, its, its com uh, other competing nations. And so we brought that into, into, the, into the discourse. Well, you know, one of the things that you had also going for you is from AIM Policy Center, you had in 
you were in touch with many of the advocates and all these movers and shakers. One of them, Gus Lagban. Tell us about that relationship and how that led you to join him in STI. Yeah, uh, the other thing, what AIM did for me was it helped expand my world and develop a network. I mean, at that point in time, on, our, on the board of the Policy Center were both Ramon and Jaime Augusto and a few other uh, top, business, all the top yeah. business people. And then all of the different advocacies allowed us to allowed me to be exposed to the different sectors. One of them was IT. At that point in time, big thrust of FVR was IT. Big thrust was how do we bring down the barriers to allow IT equipment to come in. Uh, it's, it's, it's funny when you think back, back then that was a big issue, right? You could not bring in computers without paying taxes. So we were trying to bring down uh, the, the tariffs. And at that point in time, I met Gus. So uh, Gus was very active, and we were trying to find ways to improve the telecom uh, sector. And uh, I guess, I guess uh, because of that interaction, uh, when eventually they were looking for people for SDI, he basically just invited me to join. Well, you candidly mentioned those three years as a failure. You consider that a failure in, in a learning experience. Tell us why that was and how that formed you in return. Okay, SDI was my first major organization uh, that I manage. It was, it was, it's a big organization. It had about, it had about almost 100 schools all over, all over the country. And you had to deal with different personalities from people, in the, uh, people like Mr. Yossi Tanko and uh, Gus Lagman, all the way to people who were <laughs> franchises in Surigao. And uh, trying to deal with that for the first time uh, was not easy. And I guess being my first stint at that big organization, I totally, I totally stunk. <laughs> I was terrible, I think. Uh, well, you're at least candidate to admit it. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, I, and I can imagine when I look back and think of all the people who, who I worked with, how much pain I must have cost yeah. them. Because <laughs> I really was, you know, and, and, and because I was a young CEO and you feel like, hey, you know, you're a little bit on top of the world. You're, I wasn't even 40 and you're a CEO of a top corporation and we, were, we moved office to Ayala where, where they are today. So you really feel like you're on top of the world. It kind of gets to you when you're, when you're, when you're that young and that, that early. And so I, I must admit there was some ego involved and I just didn't make the right decisions. I was, I think I was being guided more by ego, pride, image, then, then some very, very basic business uh, and business principles. And the organization's a little bit political, uh, which, which is something I also was not ready for and could not handle. And so it was, and I think at, at the, the politics, the, the ego, uh, everything combined, I just failed. I think I was a total flop. We believe that we wanted to help people change their lives through education. And the way to do that is make sure we provide a quality education. So that's what we stayed focused on. It could not be just a diploma. It could not just be a piece of paper. It had to be, be a real education that would provide them real jobs.